Good evening, dear aspirants. How are you all? Hope you are safe and fine. Welcome to Hindu News Analysis, brought to you by Shankar A.S. Academy. Today is 6th of January 2022. The list of articles we are going to discuss today is displayed on the screen. Kindly go through it. Let's start our discussion. Today, we will start off with this mains question discussion. Look at this question. It was asked in 2020 mains examination. Let me read out the question. The judicial systems in India and the UK seem to be converging as well as diverging in recent times. Highlight the key point of convergence and divergence between the two nations in terms of their judicial practices. You have to answer in 150 words. Now, what is convergence and divergence? You can simply understand this as similarities and dissimilarities. Again look at this question. It states recent times. What is recent here? Friends, it is very highly subjective. It may be a one year or one month. And when you compare with 1940s, even 2010 is recent. Let's not go into that detail. For this question, we will take last decade or so. See, the question is for 10 marks. It should not cross the word limit of 150 words. Totally, we can write 10 points. That should be more than sufficient. See, the directive is here to just highlight the key points. First, we have to brainstorm some of the points and then we can start answering. So, what can we write in the introduction? See, the provisions regarding Indian judiciary traces back its origin to Government of India Act 1935, which in itself a British legacy. So, it's quite obvious that both have similarities. But at the same time, there are many divergences, especially in recent years. Now, we will see the dissimilarities first. See, we all know the fact that Indian constitution is a written constitution and UK don't have a written constitution. Second thing is that constitution is supreme in India, whereas Parliament in Supreme in UK. That means judiciary cannot review the fairness of the acts made by the Parliament in UK. In India, judiciary can review any act made by the Parliament. Now the third point of divergence is regarding India have a single unified and integrated judiciary. In UK, it is not the case. The judiciaries of UK are separate judiciaries of the three legal systems in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and Scotland. See, UK consists of these four countries, right? Now, the fourth point is about recent development in India. See, we follow collegium system for appointment of judges, where the executive have very limited say. Judiciary themselves recommend the members to be appointed as judges to high courts. But in UK, there is a judicial appointment commission, that is JAC, to appoint judges and it is an independent body. And the final point is regarding special leave petition. See, Article 136 of the Indian Constitution allows the Supreme Court to grant special leave to appeal against any judgment or any order made by any court in the country. But there is no such procedure in the UK. We have seen the divergence. Now let's see where they are converging. See, both Indian Judiciary and UK Judiciary follow the principle of rule of law. The rule of law states that everybody are equal in the eyes of law and everybody are treated alike. Second is that both follow separation of powers. In India, we have a separation of power between judiciary, executive and legislature. See, in UK, Lord Chancellor who was the member of the legislature acted as the head of the judiciary. But now, the post has been removed. So, it ensures separation of powers between judiciary and legislature. The third point is that the judiciary is considered as the highest interpreter of the constitution. Recently, there has been a splurge in the judicial activism in Britain and judiciary is becoming more and more active. A similar evolution of judiciary has been noticeable in Indian case too. And the fourth point here is alternate dispute resolution mechanisms. See, ADS are evolving in both India and UK. They are nothing but an out-of-court settlement using third party as a mediator. It just helps to reduce the burden of cases on the courts. Example, in India, we have low adalets and legal service authorities. UK too adopted ADS for consumer disputes. And finally, both countries are now pushing for digitization of judicial proceedings. Last year, Supreme Court has released the draft vision document of e-courts project to speed up digitization in India. Also note that India enacted NJAC Act similar to Judicial Appointment Commission of UK. NJAC is nothing but National Judicial Appointment Commission. But NJAC was scrapped by judiciary citing is as unconstitutional. Which constitutional amendment act provided NJAC? If you know, post it in the comment section. See, finally, you can conclude by saying that both India and UK can learn from the best practices of each other. 
so that it will help in betterment of the country and its citizens and friends you can write your own version of the answer and post it in the comment section it will benefit other aspirants that's all regarding this question now we will take up today's first news article look at this article this is with reference to pm modi's proposed event at the punjab which was cancelled yesterday this is because his convoy was stuck on a flyover for 20 minutes as the road was blocked by protesting farmers the ministry of home affairs termed it as a major security breach in this context we will learn about spg and its functions see the spg is nothing but special protection group created in 1985 See the former prime minister of India Mrs Indira Gandhi was assassinated by two of her personal security guards in October 1984 This made the government to appoint the committee under Birbal Nath The committee submitted its recommendation to create a special protection unit to provide security to prime minister So the SPG was created with an intention to provide proximate security cover to the prime minister former PMs and their immediate family members The immediate family members includes their wife or husband, parent and their children. See proximate security is nothing but the protection provided during journey by road, rail, aircraft, water craft or any mode of transport. It includes the places of functions, engagements or even residence. The director of SPG is appointed by the central government. See the director is usually an IPS officer above the rank of inspector general that is IG. SPG comprises of the personnel from the CAPF like CRPF BSF and it also includes central and state forces every member of the group shall hold office during the pleasure of president that means they can be removed by the president at any time and the SPG innovates various methods of security and they collaborate with IB and state police forces see the SPG amendment bill which was introduced in 2019 reduced the spg coverage stating that the protection now will be offered only to the pm former pms and their immediate family members who reside with him at his official residence that means if they are outside the official residence no protection will be given that's all regarding this article now we will move on to next article friends look at this article this article here is about the visit to kavandampadi village which is a major supplier of country sugar in tamil nadu See sugar cane fields are spread out across this village but we are not going to see about the visit here we will see some basic details about sugar cane and its distribution in india see sugar cane and sugar beet are the major sources of sugar in the world out of the total sugar produced in the world 60% is obtained only from sugar cane and india stands first in area and production among the sugar cane growing countries of the world see the production area is about 3.93 million hectares and the total production in india is about 167 metric ton and it is the main source of sugar jaggery and molasses see friends sugar cane is a crop of tropical areas and it is grown in the world from altitude 36.7 degree north and 31.0 degree south it is grown from sea level up to 1000 meters of altitude see sugar cane grows well in hot and humid climate with a temperature of 21 degree celsius to 27 degree celsius know that sugar cane is a sun loving plant which means greater incident radiation favors higher sugar yields about 7 to 9 hours of bright sunshine is highly useful for both active growth and ripening of sugar cane severe cold weather inhibits bud development and it can arrest the sugar cane growth see an annual rainfall between 75 cm and 100 cm is favorable for sugar cane production and under rain fed condition it is cultivated in humid and subhumid climates irrigation is required in the areas of low rainfall and it is a largely an irrigated crop in india see depending upon the agro climatic conditions and type of soils methods of planting and use of manures and fertilizers the water requirement for sugar cane varies from place to place The hot weather associated with dry winds and drought increases the water requirement for the crop. On an average, 1 ton of sugar cane needs at least 60 to 70 tons of water, and the crop should be irrigated when available water reaches 250% level. The important point to be noted here that under water logging conditions, the root respiration becomes poor. The nutrients are leached down, the activities of useful microorganisms are reduced and the crop larges down with an excessive branching. Thus the quality becomes poor along with very low crop yield. These all make it necessary to drain the excess water from the field. 
See, sugar cane can be grown in variety of soils such as red volcanic soil and alluvial soils of rivers. That means that it does not require any specific type of soil. Now let's see the distribution in India. In Indo-Gangetic Plain, its cultivation is largely concentrated in Uttar Pradesh. And Uttar Pradesh has the largest area, almost 50% of the cane area in the country. Sugar cane growing area in Western India is spread over Maharashtra and Gujarat. In Southern India, it is cultivated in irrigated tracts of Karnataka, Tamil Nadu and Andhra Pradesh. Other states include Bihar, Punjab and Haryana. See this image. It shows the distribution of sugarcane production in the country. See the sugarcane production is highest in Uttar Pradesh followed by Maharashtra. Productivity wise, Tamil Nadu stands first with over 100 tons per hectare followed by Karnataka and Maharashtra. And Bihar has the lowest productivity among the major sugarcane growing states. Kindly note that the sugar industry is the second largest agro based industry next only to the textiles in the country. That's all for this discussion. See in this article we have discussed about sugarcane which is a tropical crop. It is grown from the altitude 36.7 degree north to 31.0 degree south. It requires hot and humid climate and the temperature varies from 21 degree Celsius to 27 degree Celsius. Sugarcane requires rainfall between 75 centimeter to 100 centimeter and it can be grown in variety of soil. We have also seen that Uttar Pradesh is the highest producer whereas Tamil Nadu has highest productivity in sugarcane production. So that's all regarding this article. Let's move on to the next article. Take a look at this article. This article discusses how misinformation particularly through internet platforms prevent women from speaking out and obstruct their progress. According to this article, despite the fact that men are targeted online, the attacks experienced by both sexes are radically different. But women are the ones who are most affected. So in this context, let us discuss some of the important points mentioned in the article. The syllabus relevant to this article is highlighted here for your reference. Please go through it. First of all, what is misinformation? See, misinformation refers to the information that is incorrect or inaccurate, especially when it is designed to mislead. According to the article, women are the most affected due to misinformation spread online. As a result, their voices are silenced and obstructing their growth in the society as a whole. See, this fact holds true regardless of one's social status. For instance, even the women politicians were affected due to misinformation. See, according to an Amnesty International analysis from last year between March and May, 95 female lawmakers out of 724 received 1 million hateful mentions on Twitter. And in that, one in every five of them being sexist or prejudiced remarks. Not only this, misinformation like other forms of abuse has intersectional challenges. Intersectional challenges arises when a person belongs to multiple social categories such as race, gender or class, all of which combine to create disadvantage or discrimination. For example, Safura Zargar is an Indian student activist leader from Jammu and Kashmir and she is best known for her role in Citizenship Amendment Act protest. See, after her arrest for participating in the protest against the Citizenship Amendment Act, pornographic videos were shared in Ms. Zargar's name on social media. This incident is a pure example of combination of Islamophobia, casteism and religious intolerance. It intersects with organized disinformation and sexism to endangered vocal women from minority communities. Now, who spreads this misinformation? See, according to this article, men are at the center of the disinformation ecosystem in India. Again, note that while women also disseminate fake news, the number of men disseminating disinformation is higher for the simple reason that they are more in number on the internet. Just because gender parity among internet users is high, men both fabricate misinformation and also believe the incorrect information. For example, we can see that there are more men in the politics and they rely on disinformation to keep propaganda alive. Even a recent report by UNESCO on online harassment faced by women journalists says that political actors instigate and fuel online violence campaigns against women journalists. Specifically talking, women journalists and activists in India have been targeted not only by troll armies but also by political party office bearers. 
And the second most important thing mentioned in the article is the relationship between misinformation and sexism. See, misinformation and sexism have a symbiotic relationship. Symbiotic is nothing but a mutual relationship between any two entities which benefits both of them. For example, misinformation uses sexism to discredit outspoken women and sexism uses misinformation to reinforce patriarchal norms. While organized misinformation and trolling affect women on a personal level, the issue that is often ignored is the effect they have on democracy. A healthy democracy is participatory and promotes gender inclusiveness. And the sexism and misinformation discourage women from speaking out, which is counterproductive to a progressing society like India. So what can be done to address this? See, strict compliance of Information Technology Rules 2021 might help us to reduce the spread of online misinformation. So let us discuss some of the provisions of the rules which must be followed strictly to reduce online misinformation. The first provision is that due diligence must be followed by intermediaries, especially social media intermediaries. Due diligence is nothing but a reasonable steps taken by a person to avoid committing an offense. The second provision is regarding grievance redressal mechanism. It is to receive complaints from the users or the victims. See, intermediaries must appoint a grievance officer to deal with such complaints and they should share the name and contact details of such officers. And the grievance officer should acknowledge the complaint within 24 hours and resolve it within 15 days from the receipt. And the third provision is that to ensure online safety and dignity of users, especially women users, complaint can be filed either by the individual or by any other person on her behalf. So it is not necessary that the victim should complain. Any person can make that complaint. See the last provision is regarding additional due diligence which should be strictly followed by the social media intermediaries. See our Facebook, Twitter and WhatsApp are called social media intermediaries. See the social media gives a platform for women to raise issues. For example, Me Too movement on social media. But at the same time, repeated abuse in the social media takes away that freedom. This is what the article mainly tries to convey us. So in this article, we have seen what is misinformation, how it is affecting women, and we have also discussed some of the provisions of IT rules 2021 to tackle the issue. With this learn points, we will move on to the next article. Look at this article. This article mentions about the water bird status survey 2022 conducted in the Chilika Lake. This census was undertaken jointly by the Odisha State Wildlife Organization, the Chilika Development Authority and the Bombay Natural History Society. The main aim of the survey is to calculate the number of incoming migratory birds. Apart from this, the news also mentions about there is an increase in numbers of greater flamingo in the region. So in this context, let us learn about Chilika Lake and flamingos in prelims perspective. See friends, Chilika Lake is a brackish water lake. Brackish water means it has a salinity of 0.5 parts per thousand to 35 parts per thousand. Over 35 ppt, it is a sea water and below 0.5 ppt, it is a fresh water. It is a shallow lagoon with estuary character spreads across three districts in the state of Odisha. See, it is fed by 52 rivers and rivulets. And the water spread area of Chilika varies between 900 to 1165 square kilometer during different season. That is, in summer, the watershed area will be 900 square kilometer and in monsoon, it will be 1165 square kilometer. This pear-shaped lagoon is about 64.5 kilometer long and its width varies from 5 to 18 kilometer. It is connected to the Bay of Bengal by a 32 km long and 1.5 km wide channel that mostly runs parallel to the Bay of Bengal. This lagoon can be broadly divided into four ecological sectors based on salinity and depth. They are Southern Zone, Central Zone, Northern Zone and the Outer Channel. A number of islands that are present in the lagoon includes Krishna Prasad, Nalaban, Somolo and Birds Islands. Now let's discuss about flamingos. See, flamingos are large birds that are identifiable by their long neck, stick-like legs and pink or reddish feathers. This flamingo embody the saying, you are what you eat. This is because the pink and reddish color of flamingo feathers come from eating pigments that are found in algae and invertebrates. That is, when they eat the algae, which is in pink color, they get pink feathers. Now note that there are six species of flamingo 
according to integrated taxonomic information system they are greater flamingo lesser flamingo chilean flamingo andean flamingo james flamingo and american flamingo out of these two flamingo species are found in india that is the greater flamingo and lesser flamingo see regarding the habitat flamingos are water birds right so they live in and around lagoons or lakes and these bodies of water tend to be saline or alkaline in this article we have discussed about chilika lake which is in odisha and the flamingo species which live in and around the lagoons that's all regarding this article now we will move on to the next article let us take this data point for discussion it provides data on the status of non performing assets that is nps in indian banks this data is based on the recently released report on trend and progress of banking in india 2020 2021 so let us see what is this report what is an npa and their status as per the report the syllabus relevant for this article is highlighted here for your reference kindly go through it see the report on trend and progress of banking in india is a publication of rbi it is a statutory publication of rbi that is released in compliance with the section 362 of banking regulation act of 1949 this report presents the performance of the banking sector during a particular period it also provides performance of cooperative banks and non banking financial institutions Now the 2020 to 2021 report is for the performance from fiscal year 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022. Among many parameters, NPS are considered as an important one to judge the performance and financial health of banks. So what is NPA? Generally, it is the asset which is non-performing, that is, which is not giving any return of interest or even the principal amount. So similarly in case of banks an asset becomes non performing when it ceases to generate income for the bank now the RBI laid down grounds based on which an asset is declared an NPA and majorly here RBI follows the 90 days overdue rule here the term overdue refers to any amount that is due to the bank under any credit facility and this due amount has not been paid on or before the due date fixed by the bank For example, if A gives a loan to B on interest, but B has not returned the interest or principal amount, then normally after 90 days, A's loan is not at all performing. So now it will become a NPA for A. So NPA is the loan that has turned bad. As you can see here, this 90-day rule is followed by RBI for term loans, bills purchased and discounted for security transactions and derivative transactions. But in case of agricultural advances. Number of crop season is taken into account to declare as NPA. Then, in case of overdraft or cash credit, the out of order criteria is used. See, an account is treated as out of order if the outstanding balance remains continuously in excess of the sanctioned limit in that account or remains continuously in excess of drawing power. But you may be thinking, why these bad loans or advances are not recognized before 90 days? Actually, they are recognized. They are mandated to be recognized by lenders. Here the lenders could be scheduled commercial banks, all India term financial institutions, small finance banks, non-banking financial companies, etc. See the lenders have to recognize the developing stress in loan amount immediately when there is a default. Default simply means the non-payment of debt. That is when whole or any part or installment of debt has become due and is payable, but it is not paid by the debtor. So an account is in default before it is declared as NPA. Therefore, when there is a default, the lenders are required to classify such assets or loan amounts as special mention accounts that is SMA. So basically, SMAs are red flags and if not addressed, they will become NPA. Now this SMA has three sub categories depending on the overdue period. If it is overdue for 1 to 30 days, it is classified as SMA 0. then it will be sma 1 when the overdue period is 31 to 60 days and when the overdue period is 61 to 90 days then it will be sma 2 and after 90 days the asset is declared as npa see here you should also know that after declaring an asset as npa banks sometimes do a thing called write off what is a write off here the write off refers to reducing the value of the asset while debiting a liability account it is done because the asset is considered uncollectable and is considered as such little value that is continuous as a bankable asset is not warranted banks write off loans or asset when all the collection methods are exhausted and importantly this write off reduces the size of a bad 
loan that is NPA. So these are the basics you need to know about NPA. Now let us see what the report has to say about it. See first it mentions that gross NPA ratio is actually declining. The gross NPA ratio is the percentage of gross NPA to the gross advances. The more the ratio more NPA. So ideally the ratio should be lower right. If you remember from 2015 to 16 gross NPAs were on a rise in scheduled commercial banks especially in public sector banks. It crossed 11 percentage in 2017 to 18. But now according to the report it is declining. This moderation began in 2019 to 20 and has continued in 2021 also. And by end of March 2021 it reached 7.3 percentage. Provincial data also suggests that there is further moderation by September 2021 and the ratio reaches 6.9 percentage. But what is the reason behind this moderation that is decline? See the first reason is reduction in fresh accretion of NPA especially in fiscal year 2021. This reduction happened partly due to the asset classification standstill. That is for some time mainly due to pandemic banks did not classify accounts as NPAs even if there were defaults. So if not classified as NPA then it will not be considered while calculating G NPA ratio. And there is another reason for decline and it is the write off. Since 2018 write offs were the predominant recourse for lowering G NPAs. It was the same in 2020 to 21. As you can see here in financial year 2021 there was 20% rights off in PSB and overall in SCB it was 23 percentage. But compared to 2020 the share of write offs in reducing NPS has come down in 2021. See the data point also talks about the stressed assets that is the accounts classified as SMA. According to the report this SMA has risen across bank groups since the outbreak of the pandemic. That's all regarding this article. Let's move on to the next article. Look at this article here. It is regarding the Gujarat High Court bench asking a journalist to speak in English. The journalist was facing a contempt of court proceeding during which he addressed the court in Gujarati language. For this the Chief Justice remarked that English is the language in the court and he offered the journalist the help of an interpreter. So this is the crux of this article. Here in this article discussion we are going to discuss about some of the articles regarding official language. First of all know that there is a separate part in the constitution which deals with the official languages. It is part 17. We are going to discuss two articles today under this part 17. The first one is article 343. See it deals with the official language of the union. According to article 343 the official language of the union is Hindi in Devanagari script. And the form of numerals to be used is the international form of Indian numerals. See class 2 of the same article states that English shall be used for official purposes for the period of 15 years from the commencement of the constitution. It is also mentioned that during this period the president may authorize the use of Hindi in addition to English. Now coming to class 3 after 15 years parliament by law may provide for the use of English language and Devanagari form of numerals for the purpose specified in the law. So it means that after the end of 15 years English will be used only for the purpose specified by a law of the parliament. See you should know that the idea behind using English for the official purpose is that it was used in all means before independence and the sudden shift to Hindi should not overwhelm the administration. So the constitution makers preferred gradual change. That is why 15 years time was given. Now let's see about article 348. It says that all the proceedings in the supreme court and in every high court and all authoritative text shall be in English language. The authoritative text includes bills, amendments, laws, acts made by the parliament or legislatures and the ordinance promulgated by president or governor rules, regulation and bylaws etc. It also says that governor with the prior consent of the president may authorize Hindi or other language for the official purpose of state and in the proceedings of the high courts. But this shall not in any case apply to the judgments, orders or degree passed or made by such high courts. So with this we have come to the end of this article discussion. Let's move on to the next article. Friends, this is our final article for discussion today. Look at this article. It says that 
according to US military North Korea fired a ballistic missile into the sea so in this context we are going to learn about ballistic missile and cruise missiles its differences and we will also see some examples first of all what is a ballistic missile see the ballistic missile is targeted as a projectile from a single launch force with not much added guidance it is launched directly into the high layers of earth atmosphere and it travels well outside the atmosphere and then the warhead detaches and falls back to earth it follows the path of a ball thrown upwards which falls down since it depends on gravity to reach its target it is called as ballistic missile see ballistic missiles fly above the atmosphere have a much longer range than cruise missiles of the same size because ballistic missiles can travel quickly along their flight path see an intercontinental ballistic missile can strike a target within a 10000 km range in about 30 to 35 minutes see ballistic missiles are some of the most feared weapon available in the world and it can be launched from ships and land based facilities there are four general classification of ballistic missiles that is short range ballistic missile that travels less than 1000 km and the second thing is medium range ballistic missiles that travels between 1000 to 3000 km and the third one is intermediate range ballistic missiles that can travel between 3000 to 5500 km and the final is intercontinental ballistic missile it travels more than 5500 km friends some of the ballistic missiles in india are agni 1 and 2 prithvi series 1 and 2 and dhanush now let's see cruise missiles see a cruise missile locates its target and has a preset target and navigates there these cruise missiles generally consist of a guidance system payload and aircraft propulsion system it is housed in a airframe with small wings and flight control see cruise missiles also can be launched from various platforms such as land sea and air cruise missiles are characterized by having different forms of guidance such as satellite gps guidance and they are known specifically for the low level flight which is staying relatively close to the surface of the earth this is to avoid detection from anti missile systems and are designed to carry large payloads with high precision the key is that this cruise missile is guided entirely to the target under its own power brahmos and nirbhay are famous cruise missiles used in india see we have finished seeing about both the missiles now we shall see some differences for your understanding see the major difference between the ballistic and cruise missiles is its path the ballistic missile is targeted with not much added guidance but the cruise missile consists of a guidance system please note that another difference is that ballistic missile travels to a high altitude so that it is easily detected by the radar but the cruise missile travels in low altitude hence they are very hard to detect see the precision of the ballistic missile is very low and it is used for larger targets but in cruise missile the precision is very high hence it is used for small and mobile targets with this learning we have come to the end of our article discussion now let's solve some of the prelims practice questions look at the first question with reference to ballistic missiles consider the following statements ballistic missiles are guided entirely to the target and the second statement is intercontinental ballistic missiles can travel more than 5500 km which of the following statements are correct one only two only both one and two neither one not two see the statement one it is regarding cruise missile cruise missiles are guided entirely to the target it is not ballistic missile so option one is incorrect we have seen that intercontinental ballistic missile can travel more than 5500 km this is a fact friends so option 2 is correct so our answer will be option b 2 only look at the second question consider the following statements brackish water refers to a water source that is somewhat salty more than fresh water but not as salty as sea water second statement is a lagoon is a shallow body of water separated from a larger body of water by a narrow landform such as reefs barrier island or barrier peninsula the third statement is an estuary is a partially enclosed coastal water body where fresh waters from rivers and streams mixes with salt water from the ocean which of the following statements are correct one only two only one and two only one two and three see the first question it is correct because 
we have seen that brackish water has salt content between 0.5 ppt to 35 ppt over 35 ppt it is sea water and below 0.5 ppt it is fresh water so statement 1 is correct see statement 2 and 3 these are definitions of lagoon and estuary you can remember that so here our answer is d 1 2 and 3 now look at the third question consider the following statement with reference to npa the first statement is an asset would be classified as doubtful if it has remained npa for a period less than or equal to 12 months and the statement 2 is special mention account that is sma is an account exhibiting signs of incipient stress resulting in the borrower defaulting after the account has been classified as npa which of the following statements are correct one only two only both one and two neither one nor two see the correct answer is option d we will see how see after declaring an asset as npa the banks are required to further classify the npas into three categories the first category is substandard asset this is the asset which has remained npa for a period less than or equal to 12 months but the asset is classified as doubtful if the asset has remained in substandard category for a period of 12 months and the last category is the last asset it is when the loss has been identified in an asset by the bank or by internal or external auditors or by rbi inspection it becomes last asset when such amount has not been written off so statement 1 is incorrect as it talks about substandard asset and for an asset to be doubtful it need to be substandard asset for a period of 12 months and not npa statement 2 is also incorrect because sma is identified before an account is classified npa and not after that now look at the fourth question with reference to official language of the union consider the following statement first statement is the official language of the union is english and the second statement is the form of numerals to be used is the devanagari form of numerals which of the following statements are correct a one only b one and two c neither one not two d two only see both the statements are incorrect because we have seen in our discussion that the official language of the union is hindi in devanagari script and the form of numerals to be used for official purpose is international form of indian numerals and not the devanagari form so our answer is option c neither one not two see the next question consider the following statement about spg spg is a special force for providing proximate security to the prime minister of india second statement is it was formed in 1988 by an act of the parliament of india which of the following statements are correct one only two only both one and two neither one not two see this is a factual question and we have discussed that spg provides proximity security to pm former pms and their family members and it was formed in 1988 by the act of the parliament so both the statements are correct and our answer is option c both 1 and 2 this is our final question with reference to the crop sugarcane consider the following statements sugarcane is a water efficient plant that is it requires less amount of water to give more yield and the statement 2 is sugarcane is a tropical crop and it grows well in hot climate Yes, friends. We have seen that sugarcane is a tropical crop, and it grows well in hot and humid climate with a temperature of 21 degrees Celsius to 27 degrees Celsius, and it is a sun-loving plant. So, statement two is correct. Statement one is absolutely incorrect because it is a water inefficient crop. It requires 75 centimeter to 100 centimeter of rainfall for the growth, and we have seen that one ton of sugarcane needs about 60 to 70 tons of water. So statement 1 is false our answer is option B 2 only the mains question is displayed on the screen write your answer post it in the comment section if you like the video hit the like button post your comments and don't forget to subscribe shankar as academy thank you